it's unfortunate that the seven steps to a highly effective presentation is next week. <laughs> so I would like to have gone to that before this, but well, I hope it's not too painful for you. Uh, and uh, that cartoon may serve as an introduction to this to some extent. I want to thank some people that have helped me uh, prepare for this. Some, some colleagues of mine, Anne-Marie Delotte, Fred Haas, Mike Hamilton, who I also teach with, he's sitting here now, and David and Nicole Mordecai uh, for helping me a lot in setting this up. Uh, I want to start with a little story. Uh, I teach advanced play psychology, and uh, we uh, have a unit on sensation and perception. And uh, we give a test on that, and they have to write an essay about perception. So they have this tendency to use the word perceive a lot in the essay, but they can't spell it at all. Uh, so we give the test back, and my colleague Mike and I asked the same questions, and we give the test back, and I, they did great, but I was teasing them about what's with this perception thing? You can't spell the word perceive. Uh, and I then told them, have you ever learned the I before E except after C? Or when it sounded like A is a neighbor in way? And they're like, no, no, I don't think we learned that. And then, OK, so remember that. And uh, then I'm writing the word on the board and talking about all their variations on the spelling of the word. Uh, and then the next test, as a bonus item, uh, we always have bonus items at the end of the test. Usually one is about psych. Try to reason this thing out that we're going to be doing later on. And then a couple of them are sort of general interest things, name four Central American countries or something like that. They don't do that well with that one either. Uh, but as bonus item number two, I asked spell proceed. <laughs> and 20% of them got it wrong. <laughs> so I'm giving back the test. It did great on the test. Giving back the test like, so bonus number two. And the kids immediately started laughing. Like, yeah, what was that question about? I said, well, you know, I just thought we'd check in whether you can spell perceive or not, because we kind of went over this before, you know. And uh, then a lot of them said, well, I thought it was a trick question. <laughs> uh, so I'm sort of like, what, what kind of trick would that have been? Well, it was, <laughs> what was the trick? <laughs> uh, because why would you then spell all these different ways of spelling perceive, which we got, I got all of those. One student of my friend and colleague Mike's, after the test, but before we had graded, was leaving the classroom and waited for all the other kids to leave. And then sort of called him over like, Mr. Hamilton, come over. Bonus number two is kind of easy. Because I think most kids know about the I before E except after C rule. And you know, the answer was also on the paper. <laughs> and uh, Mike's like, yeah, yeah, I know. it's kind of a joke, we're just checking it out. And then he checked the kid and he spelled it wrong. <laughs> now, uh, how, uh, how is that possible? So I ask him how it's possible. Another thing, they use the word a lot of kids nowadays when they write essays, they want to make a strong point. They say, this is definitely what I think about this. But they cannot spell definitely. They definitely cannot spell it. Sometimes they defiantly misspell it, I think. And you ask them, so why, why can't you do that? And they say, well, computers. Uh, it's, it's, auto, uh, it's not just spell check, but autocorrect, which I didn't even know about. And that they're typing the word definitely, and then it comes out. But they spell it, they type it like that first version there. And the computer says, oh, you must mean defiantly and uh, changes it to defiantly, and they somehow internalize this and spell definitely wrong all the time. We have another demonstration that we do, and a lot of the demonstrations that I've done over the years in psych, I've found I've had to change some uh, because I think of some of the different ways kids think now. And one example is this. The point is uh, about, well, you'll see what the point is in a second, but I'd like maybe someone uh, to offer a quick estimate, uh, if you would, What's one times two times three times four times five times six times seven times eight? Quick estimate. 400, thank you. The average response when you ask that question and you ask people to do it quickly, no calculators, 512. The second question we ask is, what's eight times seven times six times five times four times three times two times one? If you ask it that way, the average response is 2,250. 
and the answer is 40,320. But the thing, and that was the point was about framing of questions. This is a demo I've done for a long time, except now we almost can't do it because the kids will not try to answer it. And they like us, and they know we like them. So they're not just like putting their head down. But you show this, and they look at you like you've asked them to split the atom while simultaneously lifting very heavy objects. They're like, what? I'm only a kid. How could I, who could know that? <laughs> and I think that's interesting, because that wasn't true, I thought, 10 or 15 years ago. They would be playful and try. Now they feel like, well, I'm not even going to go there. Uh, and that kind of leads me to the question that is a big focus of what I want to chat about today and ask you about. To what extent has this tech world that we live in now changed the cognitive functioning of kids? And I don't know that it has. I don't really have an agenda. Uh, I'm not sure I have a thesis. I have observations and questions to ask based on my experience as a teacher and based on some demonstrations that I'd like you to share with me today if you'd like to. Completely optional, of course. Now, when you're trying to define technology, a lot of you know about this. There's so many things you could call technology, uh, high tech to lower tech. And uh, we have technology everywhere, obviously. But and uh, there's different ways of testing new technology, of <laughs> course. Uh, it's funny. When I show that to the kids, they, uh, they laugh a, real, a lot. Because uh, there's going to be pain involved, I think, is why they like that. <laughs> Anyway, when you look up definitions of technology, you see words like this a lot. And then I stumbled on this definition relatively recently. And uh, the practical part is what kind of strikes me here and might come up during our uh, talk today. Uh, just how much is technology supposed to be helping you in your cultural setting? Uh, because maybe any changes that I've noticed or my friend uh, and colleague Mike has noticed in teaching psychology, or as I say, I teach a class on thinking, and I also run a philosophy club, after school philosophy club. So we get a lot of evidence about the way kids think. And maybe the way they're thinking, even if it's different than when I was a kid, is fine. And it's exactly what we need them to be able to do. Uh, and what I want to focus on especially is in terms of attention. And what is the cultural value of being able to divide your attention and to selectively attend to particular things while filtering out other things? And are kids different in their functioning in these ways? Uh, also, and I've asked my students this, is kind of focusing attention actually a problem in some contexts? That you, uh, in creative problem solving, for instance, creative production, you might really want to open and have more like a childlike mind. A two-year-old child is terrific at taking in all kinds of different stimuli and making a lot out of it. That's how they learn. And uh, some people have argued that it's not that adults are better at paying attention. They're better at not paying attention. Adults are good at filtering out irrelevancy and focusing on what they need to focus on. That could be a hindrance, actually, in creative thinking. Uh, and uh, Mike and I especially have talked a lot about, he actually framed this question first, that the, in some ways maybe kids value knowing different now. Because they have so much access, quick access to information, the value of knowing for its own sake may be something that's changing. Likewise, the value of a short-term memory capacity, and we do a lot on memory and psych, and I'd like to do a couple of short-term memory demonstrations with you today. You might have done some before, and if you want to play along, that's what that little uh, half sheet is. Grab that. Uh, some of you may also, from your schooling, may know some about this. And it's a very controversial theory. The Whorf-Sapir hypothesis is a Sapir-Whorf hypothesis, or the linguistic relativity hypothesis, the argument that your language really influences the way you think. Does a naturalist n actually experience a walk in the woods differently than I do? Because they know names of birds and names of trees that I do not know. So when we're walking in the woods looking at the same thing, they actually have a different cognitive and perceptual experience than I do. 
does someone who knows a lot, I love horses, but I don't know anything about horses. If I went to a stable, I would think, oh, big horse, small horse. That's the extent of my categorization. Someone who knows horses well and can identify horse breeds or particular horses, do they think about horses differently because they have those words? The classic example they used to use that probably a lot of you have heard of is the alleged uh, fact that uh, Eskimos, Inuits, have many different words for snow and therefore think differently about snow or their environment than we do. That's been called into a lot of question, but I'd like us to think about this while we're talking. How much does the uh, thinking of kids now, uh, how much it has changed because they know language and computer interface and so on that certainly people of my generation did not know. So, yes. One of the problems that, 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 that thesis, uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with your thesis, but the way you're expressing it, the way many people express it, doesn't draw a distinction between language and, um, uh, and knowledge. I mean, all the examples you gave, it's not just a matter of having a lot of words for different birds, but it's a matter of having knowledge that this bird is different from that bird. My understanding of their thesis is that it's independent of knowledge, that it's a question of actually having words for things regardless of whether you have specialized knowledge. So I just want to draw the distinction, at least when I, when I was in college, they, 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 they said that there, my, I was taught that there was a distinction being made between knowledge and language itself. And all of the examples people seem to use you know, kind of combine those two. Yeah, and the combinations happen a lot. I think there are hard versions of the linguistic relativity hypothesis and soft versions and versions that have it only going one way, language is influencing your thinking, and others that say it's always a cross wiring. I I would I see your point about the particular examples I use there. They may not fit very well. Uh, for me this is another one of my uh, observations that makes me wonder about how much kids' cognitive world has changed because of the things they've been exposed to and even a language they've been exposed to. Whether that's valuable or even accurate interpretation, I guess I'll leave to you when we're done. Thank you, though, for, those, uh, for that clarification. So some of you saw this before. What did that say? Actually, it did not say a bird in the bush. There were two thes there. Uh, most people, a lot of people missed that, many of you did. Uh, why so is the question. And uh, I've had that up there for three or four minutes, calling on kids in class. So what did that say? A bird in the bush. Is that what it said? How about you, Bobby? A bird in the bush. Jess? A bird in the bush. We've covered this. Let's move on. And then you actually have to point out that there were two thes there. Now, that's a simple example of many things. One is about perceptual set. What you expect influences your actual perceptual world. A uh, concept that some people call minimum tendency, that we do the least possible to perceive the world. We don't want to interpret every word. We read holistically, not uh, word by word. Little children, some would say, and I've seen some evidence of this because I used to be a preschool teacher, so I would do things like this with them, the weird diabolical child experiments. And, uh, <laughs> And children are less likely to be fooled by that because children read word for word. We don't read that way. You're a really smart audience, and maybe because you're a smart audience, you're even more likely to fall into that tiny little cognitive trap, which may not mean much, but it leads us to a little discussion about attention. And some of you have probably seen this before, and if you have, I apologize, but uh, uh, I'll run it for those of you who have not. And, uh, I'm about to show you a video, it's kind of poor quality, and you can see versions of this on YouTube. And the, on the video, there is a team of people playing catch with a basketball. And uh, they're running around, they're not particularly athletic, so don't be judgmental. And they're throwing the ball back and forth between uh, each member of their team. And then superimposed on that is another image of the same three people playing catch with a basketball, except they are wearing black shirts and the other team is wearing white shirts. So you'll see two teams of people playing catch with a basketball. One team is wearing white shirts, the other is wearing black shirts. I'd like you, as best you can, uh, to yourself, count the number of times the black-shirted team completes passes to someone on their team. 
So just count in your head, please. Let's see how we do. And uh, ideally, we do this one-on-one, -on -one, of course, so don't count out loud and uh, keep your uh, insights to yourself until we're done. Pay close attention to the players in the black shirts. Count the number of passes they complete to each other. Sorry for the quality. Okay. <laughs> How many of you did see the woman with the umbrella? A lot of you have seen it. There's a great version of this. Some of you did not see it, though. Uh, How many passes? 16? 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 13, 16 to 20. You say what? Black to black, 16. 16. Black Zero. to black. 18. Zero. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Are you a heckler? <laughs> Why, why are you saying zero? Uh, I mean, many of you have seen it. Have you seen the gorilla version on YouTube? I thought you would have. I asked some people, like, do you think people will know this? And I didn't know if you would. The, in the original version of this, which is done by Ulrich Neiser and other, many other people have replicated it, 80% of people did not see the woman with the umbrella. Even though once you know the woman with the umbrella is there, you can't not see her. Uh, and uh, in the version that you can see on YouTube, um, just YouTube like gorilla suit, they have people doing a task and then if someone walks through the screen in a gorilla suit and they dance around. And uh, this was uh, one study done in 1999 with that 46% of people missed that. A man in a gorilla suit dancing around. By the way, in this little picture, maybe I'm counting wrong, but there were 20 passes completed between the black shirted teams. Uh, and that, that interests the kids a lot. We're like making a the point. They're like, but how many passes were completed? That's what really matters. Uh, uh, we have another version where it's 24, but anyway. Now, that's sometimes called inattentional blindness for dynamic events, which is a flashy term for how did you miss the woman with the umbrella? Uh, but there, it, the idea there was you're asked to selectively attend to a black-shirted team and filter out the white-shirted team. You did terrifically well, some of you because you're familiar with it, others because you're just good at that stuff. Are people good at that? Still. Are kids good at that? Are people, are there different differences now because of our experiences uh, technologically and otherwise? And some would say that a big part of our attention is based on stimulus salience. And you'd think an umbrella lady would have some stimulus salience there. But again, many people in the original study miss the moment with the umbrella. So I'd like to do another little task for you. That's a study from 2002. Yes, sir. The example you gave actually has some serious real-world uh, uh, significance. My wife is reading a book now called How Doctors Think. And they give quite a few, I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but they give quite a few examples of cases where doctors are given a patient to examine or they're given an x-ray to look at or something like that. They're given some information about what to look for, like when you're looking for a tumor or something, and they will totally miss the fact that the person doesn't have an arm. Or, you know, some other major, you know, the missing walk and this kind of thing. So it, it could actually you know, have real more time. And I think that is fascinating. And part of the point is, I think a lot, and I just certainly don't want to sound this way, even though I'm getting older, I don't think in any way that I'm, I'm, I, I want to be saying some of these things are quite predictable like that. And certainly among kids, some of these things are quite predictable. You know about the umbrella lady one, a lot of people are going to miss it. And that doesn't mean a lot of kids feel like they're not smart. How did you miss he didn't have an arm? But it's actually predictable that people will make some of those cognitive mistakes because their focus is somewhere else. And that's what I want to get at here, I think. So again, thank you. Uh, and this is replicating some work from 2002. In a moment, I'm going to show you quickly a set of letters in the center of the screen, OK? And I want you to just think in your head, uh, are they all the same letter? 
or is one of them different from the others? Each of the arrays has five letters. Uh, please just, in your head, uh, ask yourself, are they all the same letter? Or is one of them different? Okay, so here we go. You're only gonna see it for a second. Are they all the same? No. Pretty confident? Let's do another task. Here we go. Ready? All the same? Yes. The rotation hurts me. Maybe I'm just bad spatially, but uh, that, I, I have a little trouble with that. But anyway, here we go. Here's the third one. Ready? All the same? No? Confident? Hmm. Okay, here's the fourth. All the same? You're doing great. Ready? Copy? Good. Okay. All the same? You're batting a thousand. All the same? All the same? Okay. So that little study is at least one study in divided attention. You have to focus on the task. And then you have the very quick, in the original study, uh, it was a quarter of a second flash. Mine's a little longer. Uh, and it was fun to do with the kids, because you ask them, because they blurred out. They're like, whoa, my, what's with the, you know, rabbit? Uh, like, yeah. it's supposed to be quiet on that one, but anyway. Uh, how um, would you do in identifying those little images that flashed on the screen, you think? How would you do recalling them, yes? Could you name four of them? How about a recognition test? If I gave you a list of possible things, would you be able to say, yes, there was a blender? Was there a blender? You look confident. Uh, what they actually follow, I'll tell you more in a second, but let's check to see, okay? Everyone answer. Is there a horse? I'm hearing both. Good, okay. Was there a hammer? Yes. You're right, the answer was either yes or no. Uh, was there a fruit? I asked that in class, and the kids were like, is a pineapple a fruit? It's like, okay, you, you've both given away the answer and betrayed an alarming lack of knowledge. Uh, was there a kitten? Yeah. Here's actually the answer. There was a gavel. Would you have taken a hammer as a correct answer? Yes. Uh, a telephone and so on. Did it matter where they were? Yes. Did it matter the location? Yes. Because <laughs> ideally, I think once you get the first couple, you knew something else is going to happen. Now you're on your guard. It changes things. I think ideally, we probably would have done a single slide with a bigger group. But what the researchers found in this was that uh, the question asked was recognition question. Did you see something? Yeah. What was it? I don't know. Was it an animal or was it not an animal? And half of them were animals and half of them were not. So if they just guessed, they'd be 50-50. But they found 76% accuracy rate in identifying whether it was an animal or not. So even though it's a really quick flash and you're selectively attending to the letters, you are able to divide your attention consciously, uh, volitionally, or otherwise, to get this other image. So it's certainly possible, more than possible, to divide your attention, uh, even when you're focusing on a relatively, uh, uh, I don't want to say that's a difficult task, but a specific task. I'm not sure if people in the back could hear your clicker, but I found this, the sound of you clicking to bring up the image actually helped me to shift my attention. How many people could hear the clicker? Do you know uh, the Umbrella Lady video? This is one of the things we did before. On the, I pulled it off YouTube. And we have a film version we use at school. But it had a little beep whenever a pass was completed, which I thought, well, that's an entirely different task. So in fact, I have to change the muting here, which careful if the lights go off, you'll know I screwed this up. Uh, oh, there we go. Good. Yes, because I had to mute that, because otherwise I was quite sure the front row could hear it. And that would have cued you, too. I didn't think of this, though. That's interesting. Let's hope. I'll, I'll 
I'll m mute it in the future. <laughs> uh, so one of the things as we were just talking about, people, our perceptions are always somewhat skewed by our expectations and uh, our constructions. We all have schemas, expectations of what we would see or perceive in certain situations. And of course, they're influenced by that. And I think with our kids especially, it helps to simply know that, that your like eyewitness testimony is always going to be flawed because there's so much you're bringing to the perception, never mind the recall of it later on. So we can grant, I think most of us probably can grant, that sometimes our perceptions and memories are a construction. They're not actual representation of what, what happened in its fullest sense. But again, I want to ask the question, and that some people at Stanford asked the same question. To what extent does the kids expose you to the technological world that we're in? Uh, benefit or inhibit kids' ability to filter information, to decide I'm going to attend to this and not attend to that. Uh, if I attend to this, can I also get this? And uh, these researchers, and many of you may know about this, although it was published only in August of 2009 at Stanford, was about multitasking. And uh, the little half sheet that's around the room I gave you uh, is a little score sheet you can do if you want to try this yourself. Um, I asked my kids a question similar to what they asked. Are you someone who frequently and somewhat efficiently uh, is a media multitasker, they call it. You're taking in multiple media streams at one time with some success. And my measure was rel relatively crude, I think, but I could not retrieve what their measure was, so I made one up of my own. And I broke the kids into groups of being high multitaskers, medium, middle multitaskers, and low multitaskers. My uh, N was 123 kids. Not all of them fit neatly and went to one of those, so I threw out the kids who didn't fit in. And then I tried to replicate the study that these people did at Stanford. And if you think you might want to take part in it quickly, I have a few more of these things and pieces of paper. Oh, some of you do. Good. Okay. Sorry. I'll give you a couple there, and you might need something to write with. And please feel free to completely blow this off if you want to. Pass that down a little bit. A few more people. Sorry, this is not effect efficient. I may run out shortly, but uh, yes, pencil two. That's good. And now I'm all oh, good. It's a few more. Sorry, you got one. I'm sorry. I might be out. I didn't expect as big a crowd. So, thank you for participating. I did this with my students, and then we debriefed it some, and you can tell me what you think about it afterwards. Uh, of course, a lot of people, and you probably know more about this than I do, would say multitasking is a misnomer, that nobody actually multitasks, that a better term might be really, really speedy sequential processing rather than true multitasking, uh, that even a great juggler, they can have all these balls and pins and mallets and flaming uh, torches and small children up in the air and so on, but they're only acting on a limited number of them. Uh, maybe that's what we're doing when we're supposedly multitasking. Uh, but here's what I'd like you to do. We'll do a practice one first. I, I'm going to show you some arrays. Please attend to the red rectangles. There are going to be some rectangles. Please attend to the red rectangles and ask yourself, do any of them change orientation on the screen? Uh, and I think that may make sense to you, but let's do a practice one and then you'll see what we mean. Don't write anything on this one. This is just a practice one, but here we go. Do any of the reg rectangles change orientation? I'm going to show you two slides. Slide one, slide two. Your question, do any of them change orientation? Here we go. Just And slide two. And were the two red rectangles in practice example one in the same orientation as those, those in practice example two? No, they were different. So you would just circle the word different on that little score sheet. I'm going to do 10 examples. Notice uh, one to five is in the left-hand side, and then six starts on the right-hand side. Uh, so let's try that. Just circle the correct answer, and then we'll check to see how you did. And then I'll report what they found. So here we go. Here's one A and one B. Ready? 
and 1B. Go. I guess to control for possible confounding variables, uh, let's say don't circle it until I say go. Okay, here we go. Here's 2A and 2B. First 2A, ready, and 2B. Go. 3A and 3B coming up. Here we go. Here's 3A and 3B. Go. Here's 4A and 4B. First 4A, ready? And then 4B. Go. Halfway home. Here's 5A and 5B. Ready. And 5B. Go. Again, 6A and 6B move up to the right hand column. Here's 6A. Ready. And 6B. Go. Here's 7A, ready? And 7B, go. In the home stretch here, here's 8A, ready? And 8B, You might want to go to the bathroom now if you want. <laughs> uh, so quick reminder, pay attention to the red rectangles. <laughs> and here's 9A, ready. And here's 9B. Did the two red rectangles change orientation? Same or different orientation? And finally, 10A and 10B, then we'll see how you did. Here's 10A, ready, and 10B. Good. Did you think that was a hard task? Did you have a strategy, particularly? What was your strategy? Anyone want to share their strategy? Um, if the rectangles were lines, finding where they intersected. It's very interesting. A couple of students said that, and I was completely like, wow, I never would have done that. Does that have, did the, how many of you did something like that? Any other strategy that was very different from that? Yes. Ah, yes. And, and some kids were very good at pointing out the fact that, especially on a white screen, that there's a little after image effect. And I, it's, it's not sharp. I mean, kid saying that is sharp. A kid said, well, I did it because I just, when we had done sensation and perception. We knew about after image effects and so on. But he had applied it. I didn't know how to control for that. And the red and blue rectangles is what they used at Stanford. So I'm, I'm sure I'm doing something different from what they did, but it was my best attempt. Didn't, didn't need I'm sorry? Didn't need it was, just was it? Because that's interesting. I felt like this was pretty yeah, easy. Yeah. <laughs> for 10, yes. I tried to form a sort of a gestalt with the two red rectangles ah. plus, which isn't no extending lines or anything, just noting that mm -hmm. whole figure. And when you were trying to get a gestalt of, the, of that arrangement, was it hard to filter out the irrelevant rectangles? Not at all. How about the last two? I, that was my addition. Uh, they did not do it at Stanford. I added the two yellow rectangles after the heckler commented on the red. Uh, uh, did the yellow distract you at all? Because in a couple of my classes, as soon as the yellow was there, kids were like, whoa, oh, geez. Yellow, what? With the yellow. And, uh, and that's interesting, I think. Now, that's partly being a kid, I suppose. But. I was just going to say, I use the same strategy of trying to filter out everything except the image of the two red triangles. And the yellow triangles were slightly distracting. Although I don't think they should be off enough that I could do it, but it's like, whoa, another thing to filter out. 
but you were able to filter it out. Good. Well, let, yes. <laughs> Everyone behind you would have benefited. Like, I didn't even look at the screen. I just looked at her. Uh, let's see how you did. Okay, check yourself. Honor system. One through five. Same, same, different, same, different. Anyone batting a thousand so far? Oh yes. And then six through ten. Same, same, different, different, same. How many of you get nine or more of those correct? Look at that. That's not how it went at Stanford. <laughs> so let's try a couple more tasks and then we'll tell you more about the actual study. This was actually a version of also something done at this study. Uh, and I'm going to show you a quick array. It's only going to be uh, there for a moment. It's letters and numbers. You simply are going to identify whether the numbers in the array are even numbers or odd numbers. Please don't circle your answer on your sheet until I say go. Okay? So you see now we're on number 11 on the selective attention side. Please tell me, are the numbers in the following array even numbers or are they odd numbers? Don't, write, don't circle until I say go. Ready. Go. Here is number 12. Are the numbers even numbers or are they odd numbers? Ready? Go. Here's 13. Another array, are the letters in the following array vowels or consonants? And in a couple of my classes, I asked for kids asked for clarification <laughs> on that. I was expecting me, does Y count? And I said, I kept Y out so not to mess with you. But that wasn't enough. For, and I absolutely, you're not going to find anyone who loves the kids more than I do. Uh, so I don't mean to be critical of them. It was just interesting. Uh, so are the letters in the following array vowels or consonants ready? Don't write until I say go. Go. And finally, uh, not finally, but and last of this type, here's number 14. Are the letters in the following array vowels or consonants? Ready? Go. And one more task, but first let's check ourselves at 11 through 14, see how you did. Odd, odd, consonants, vowels. Nod your head if you get all of those. OK, you're kicking butt. <laughs> Nod your head and people raise their hand. <laughs> anyway, last one is also a version of something done in the Stanford study. Item 15, I'm about to show you two arrays of letters, one after another. You're going to be asked a question about both of them and just circle yes or no on item 15. Then there's a backside to that piece of paper if you want to do the next part of this. But for item 15, you're going to see two letter arrays. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question then. You circle the answer yes or no. Here we go. Ready? OK. Here's another. Ready? Were there any letters in the second array that were also in the first array? Yeah, so in a few minutes, <laughs> you should go now. Uh, do any of you still have kind of a little iconic image of those numbers in your head? I saw some of you close your eyes. Like you still had a little bit? Yeah. I think that's a very difficult task because it's both attention and memory, and that's a lot to hold in short-term memory. Uh, the kids thought that was, what are you, crazy? Difficult. Uh, what was the answer? Were there any letters in the second array? The letter P. Would you accept it? I asked the kids this. If someone said yes, but they couldn't identify the letter, is that? And, and the answer was yes. But they couldn't identify the letter. Is that a correct answer? Even though they said yes, and you'd be like, well, which letter was it? And they're like, well, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's, would that be meaningful? Wouldn't they need to identify them? Huh? No, it wasn't. And I was just asking as kind of a point of methodology. Uh, the answer was yes, and it was P. Uh, how many of you knew it was P? Everyone's going to raise their hand now. But, uh, uh, I think that's a very difficult task. Um, but my question is, do these demo versions of this study actually measure anything? And I asked the kids this, and a lot of them felt like, you know, 
I don't think there's much relationship between those tasks and my ability to multitask or my ability to attend. And I asked him to elaborate it on. They elaborated in very intelligent ways. Uh, maybe they don't really measure much of anything. Uh, but um, what the researchers at Stanford found was one of their lines was that some of their, especially the people who identified themselves as high multitaskers, they were frequent multitaskers and they were good at it, actually did worse than the others. And in fact, when it came to one of the rectangle arrays, they went right off the table. Bad, dramatic difference. And one of the conclusions they reached was that they were ineffective at suppression of the activation of irrelevant task sets, which is a flashy way of saying they couldn't filter out irrelevancy very well. And it was especially true of people who had labeled themselves as high media multitaskers. This is a quote from their study. And again, it's about filtering relevance versus irrelevance. Yes? Is, is this really the same thing as the tension deficit disorder? Uh, well, because we teach psych, we deal with that a lot and talk about the parameters, uh, sort of the operational definition of what ADHD is. And as some educators in the room, and we certainly discussed this a lot, where's the line between a kid being a kid and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? And uh, I don't know. I wonder why, and I used to work a lot with little kids and with mentally handicapped people, and we now teach psych, so I know I can list you the criteria supposedly for ADHD, but I still don't know. Is it true, though, that maybe we've actually created more ADHD? Uh, at least that's a question we have to ask about this. And the kids did not seem to think so. But I want to get to that in a second. I'm sorry. I mean, the way you're presenting this, you're showing something in your little flag screen and you show another one. If someone is used to always switching to different things, their brain automatically doesn't want to associate things. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me like you ask them to do something that they're, they're naturally tend not to do. So the first reaction would be not to. So they may have to say, not relevant, well, no, it's relevant. That's not enough time. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying is there may not be anything wrong with the brain. It's just that they do different things, and they're used to the practice different things. I really want to uh, emphasize that I completely agree with uh, your observation that there's nothing wrong with their brain. I, ADHD aside, the kids we're talking about in school, uh, that's one of the things that interests me is I think occasionally both Mike and I have seen in my, I would say the last 10 years, it seems to me short-term memory capacity and attention has changed, but I could be wrong. And it's not about kids these days, they won't pay attention. Or they're not as smart as they used to be. The thing that strikes me is I think the kids are just as smart, they just blow me away with how smart they are. Yet I don't see as much of a correlation between their intelligence in this broad sense and some of their functioning in this stuff, like especially the short-term memory stuff. Now, does that have to do with uh, culture-induced ADHD or not? I don't, I don't know. Is uh, the prevalence of ADHD now just a result of us identifying parameters for it and therefore overusing the label? I don't know that either. Certainly, that's a factor as well. But I'd like to revisit these questions when we're done with the short-term memory part, if you don't mind. Uh, anyway, to get the flow again, this is a quote from their study. They do not do as good a job filtering out irrelevancy. And they have more trouble ignoring irrelevant stuff when they're trying to form memories. Uh, and less effective in suppressing the activation of irrelevant task sets. But let's... Uh, uh, one of the quotes that I thought was really striking in the article was, we kept looking for what they're better at, we couldn't find anything. Even though they were co quite confident they were better at it. And I do think, especially we have discussions about this in our school, our school with be thinking seriously of going to one-to-one uh, -one laptop experience in the school. And I, I uh, have no problems with technology or computers and so on, but I do wonder if we should at least continue to consider questions like this when we're making decisions like that. Uh, is it actually developing the cognitive world we want? Is it what they need to be able to do? I don't know. It's really a question that I have more than anything. 
Uh, actually, I asked the kids like this. Are you better at, uh, at filtering irrelevancy and uh, juggling multiple media streams because you've had lifelong experience looking at a screen that has five windows open, which I cannot do. I, my brain explodes. Uh, and playing video games? Or are, we, are you actually, uh, because you're so used to flitting around, are you unable to not flit? And the kids felt like they, that experience had actually helped them attend. And that's where I think these results were significant. And you can see, this is just one chart, and I'm not, obviously, I'm not equipped to present their research. But in the rectangle presentation, you notice that sometimes there were two distracting rectangles, two blues. And others, there were four. And others, there were six blue rectangles. And they found that the people who were high media multitaskers did fine a little better, actually, than the people who would characterize themselves as low media multitaskers until it got to six distractors and then they fell right off the cliff. Now it was a relatively small sample actually, but a serious research was doing serious research. Uh, that was striking and I did not find that in my kids. Now this is, uh, I, just, I just wanted you to see it, it's too much to try to absorb, but uh, according to my measurement, these were my distributions of kids who would label themselves as high, middle, or low multitaskers. And I don't know, I didn't crunch, uh, do t-test, or I didn't do any statistical significance. I don't know if there's a statistically significant difference there. But the kids did not seem to think there was. And they were really surprised at the Stanford finding, and I know I was too. Uh, so one of the things they asked um, was maybe the kids Nowadays, who are good media multitaskers, maybe their attention is different, but their memories are better. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do this stuff. They're doing something to allow them to do it with some success. And that's the second part of this little uh, demonstration. Do you know, were the Stanford subjects high school kids? No, they were Stanford students. Okay. And their end was only 100. But I'm sure it was a representative sample, at least of Stanford kids, which impressed my students a lot. They know Stanford is supposed to be a pretty good school. So they weren't just picking people off the street like the guy who didn't know about the red rectangles. They were actually, you know, they were picking from a pretty big, pretty positive pool. Um, when the um, researchers said that they were unable to find what the high multitaskers were good at, do we know if this is because they asked the high multitaskers what they'd be better at? and observe what they might be better at and try everything? Or is it simply a failure of imagination on the part of the researchers? Well, my reading of the, of the uh, report is this, that they went in um, thinking, wondering about this question. And then they did, my sense was they did the rectangle study first. And they were surprised somewhat by the findings, that they, there was such a precipitous drop with the high multitaskers. So that kind of leads to the second part of it. They actually wondered, at least in the one write-up I read, in an a, a article about the write-up, in both cases it came up, they asked, uh, well, maybe, maybe we're asking the wrong question here. And maybe they're just better at something else. And we're not really measuring their ability to multitask by doing this task. There's got to be something else going on. And one of the things they built in was the vowels and consonants task. Do you remember? Now, I didn't do it, I think, the way they did it. I just wanted you to see it. But what they found was the students, again, who had identified themselves as high media multitaskers, what they called that was a task switching uh, array. That you would have a letter, a, a letter and number array like I had. And in the first condition, you say, OK, I would like you to attend to the numbers. Tell me if they're even or odd numbers. And they do fairly well, as you probably did. Uh, but then the next array would be, okay, another array, attend to the, con the letters. Are they vowels or consonants? And they didn't do well. And the conclusion the Stanford people reached was they aren't, they're still not fixated on, but they're still distracted by the task before. It's now, look at another array, but we're just asking you to do something slightly different, and they weren't able to make that switch. 
which I don't even believe, frankly. And my kids were able to do it, although in this setting. But they argued, no, they weren't good at it. Yes. Ah. I didn't write the numbers. So I had that exact problem. That's the one I got wrong. Thank you for sharing that. Do you think others would have that problem if I had gone faster? Yeah. If it had been okay, vowels or consonants, letter, your, that, that would have been a difficult task, I would think. Yes? I don't think it's the same task because one is much more abstract than the other. I think you know, trying to determine whether something's a vowel or a consonant is much more abstract. I think one way to control for that probably would be some kind of counter down thing where in some cases the first question you would be asked is the vowels or consonants one, another one would be even an odd to at least try to control for the fact that that might be a different task. But with the same idea, when we do some short term memory stuff, one of the versions I do is to try to filter out meaning altogether because I think that's a legitimate concern anyway. Yes? Mm -hmm. I don't think they did. And actually, when I was setting these demos up, I kept rereading it, trying to, they weren't as specific in some cases. Maybe they were somewhere, but I could find it on their method. I think I'm replicating it here. But I actually thought some of them would be too easy. And this is where I asked a couple of my colleagues, especially Mike, my colleague, like, should I prep them before and say, this is the task you're about to do? Because I felt like that's going to be too easy. Uh, but as near as I could tell from the reading, that is what they did. And I think if they didn't, it would have been as much of a test of short-term memory capacity as attention and task switching. So it seemed to do better to do it this way. And they still found the same problem this gentleman shared with us, that, that it had nothing to do with their intelligence, but they weren't able to task switch as well quickly. Yes. I'm yep. wondering about whether there were more, I mean, there could have been odd and even, but mm -hmm. you're at your work. How many of you did go, you found one thing done? Yeah. It seemed to me good strategy. The kids in my classes did fine with that. But they found the Stanford study, the people, again, I just find this part so interesting, the people who identified themselves as people who were good at juggling multiple tasks were actually not good at switching tasks in that relatively simple uh, Problem. So the, the classification of successful high multitasking was self-reported? Yeah, actually, and I think... Are we just measuring people that overestimate their abilities? Well, that's... <laughs> I have a little part about that at the end, yes. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, because they used a measure that I'm not familiar with, and I couldn't find it. So... I made one up of my own, but it was all self-report. This was a self-report, but it was a, maybe a more uh, vetted self-report that they would have argued was, I'm sure, reliable and valid. But uh, they may well. <laughs> Who knows? You're stealing one of my lines from later, though. That's it. OK, talk's over. Uh, yes? They didn't report one. I did not see. Do you think there would be? Mm -hmm. Yes, the adaptive function, again, it goes back to maybe whatever they're learning now is what they need to to be adaptive to this society. And that I, I think of that as somewhat folklore, although I buy a lot of evolutionary psych. The idea that well, the woman has to have the baby on the hip, and she's also cooking and yelling at the husband to go hunt, and so on all at once. So I guess that would be adaptive where the guy can hunt and then nap. Basically, but 
But we don't hunt as much anymore for that reason. Yes. Uh, in counter to that, I would point out that these are Stanford students or high school students, not adults. Uh, and I've heard the same piece of folklore, but the explanation I've heard has not to do with cavemen out hunting. It has to do with the fact that in our current culture, women manage both a job and a household with multiple people in it and a huge array of tasks, whereas men are by and large uh, still free to focus just on the job. Uh, and if that explanation is correct, and you pick 30-year-olds who maintained households for a decade, you might see a big difference that wouldn't hmm. be there at all in the college team. It's not a genetic gender difference, it's a cultural gender difference. One of the other questions I thought of when you asked your question was, I'm assuming I'm making these stats up that males play more video games or at least particular types of video games than females. Would that training have actually helped them or does it hurt them? And I think that goes back to this big question, is this helping them filter better? Is it necessary that they filter better? Maybe we don't need them to do that as much. I don't know. More good questions. Yeah. I found myself trying to like predict guess, mm -hmm. about what I was going to be asked to do mm -hmm. letter sets, you know, and that, that was kind of distracting because I was trying to memorize the first, you know, I mean it was it was cognitively distracting. I was kind of different things going on in my head at once because I, I didn't know what I was going to be asked to do. Again, I may not have read their research well enough. But the reason I put it where I put it was to segue between the attention part and the memory part, because I thought that was both tasks, for sure. Uh, that's why I put it there. I'd be really open to hearing more about how I should frame that, or how they framed it. And I just don't know enough to say. Did the Stanford researchers make any attempt to uh, map performance on these tests to anything actually going on in the brain? Did they do functional MRI or PET scans or anything like that? Because I found on that number 15 also, I was, I was trying to take a mental picture. I was not trying to analyze it at all. I, was, I didn't know what the question was going to be. And all the other ones I was trying to analyze. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like maybe different parts of my brain were involved. Yeah. Did they try to look at They didn't. They did mention in passing the kind of research that maybe a lot of you are familiar with, looking at PET scans, positron emission tomography, functional MRI, uh, that when people are allegedly multitasking, there's a lot of evidence that they're not actually multitasking. They're quickly switching. Uh, they made reference to that research. They said nothing more about that during this task, though, and that would be interesting. When you use the term multitasking, is that all you mean, that uh, 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 rapid fire changes in tasks? Because I'm wondering, for example, all of us probably have had the experience of driving to work listening to something on the radio, you get to work, you know, half an hour later, you don't remember anything that you were doing, but you remember what you heard on the radio, mm -hmm. or in my case, I listen to podcasts while I'm cooking, I'm doing all kinds of complex cooking stuff, but I'm not confusing my, you know, my peppers with my carrot mm -hmm. but meanwhile, I'm listening to some technical topic, that's multitasking, isn't it? I mean, yes, parallel processing, it's sometimes called, we do this in sensation and perception too, and even the kids who've only, only been driving for a year. All you have to do is say, so have you ever driven anywhere for 45 minutes and you got there and you do not remember driving there? No drugs, no alcohol, nothing? And they're all like, yeah, I do that a lot. And meanwhile, they were making all the lights, changing the CD, fixing the iPod, talking to someone in the back seat. Someone's watching a movie back there. All of this is happening and they're still driving this 3,000 pound missile without anyone dying. Uh, so clearly we can do that, yeah. The distinction I would make, just simple distinction that I think they made, media multitasking is attending to multiple in sensory inputs, whereas multitasking in general is performing multiple tasks at one time. Does multiple mean two or nine? I don't know. More than one, for sure. If I had to define it, that's the best I could do. It seems to me, though, you can do multiple tasks by only attending one. That's really what you're doing. Hmm. When you're driving, when you're listening to something else, you're really doing more than one task. You're only attending to one. And I think we had the same, uh, I think what confirms that some is the study earlier with the pineapple and the kitten and so on. You're attending to the letters, but you're still 
simultaneously able to process this other thing to which you're not attending, but you're able to divide your attention. And we've all done it with driving, uh, for sure. So I think it's amazing what we can do cognitively. And I certainly wouldn't want to belittle that, and our kids do it great too. But then, uh, to emphasize that point, this top comment, um, sometimes I would say, like a lot of teachers will quit, like, Kids don't know how to take notes that are meaningful now. And so I'd be like, I think, yeah, no kidding. We know nobody ever could. Because you need to have some framework for that. And you need to have some uh, domain knowledge to make good what I would think of as relevancy decisions. And I know for me, uh, you've probably seen quotes like that before. The more information you have uh, that you're exposed to, the more expertise you need, not even expertise, but some cognitive framework to make relevancy decisions. And I know for me, uh, I'm going to jump ahead for a second. I think sometimes we, I wanted to do one other example. I think sometimes in education, we will interpret kids' preference for multitasking. So common in our classes, like, how many of you like to study with music on in the background? And they're like, yeah, I like that. Do you do it well? And they're like, I haven't really thought of that part yet. They like it, but do they do it well? And I do think sometimes, anyway, we tend to conflate those. And um, I know for me, especially when I don't have a cognitive framework for it, I have trouble filtering and making relevancy decisions. Earlier this year, I sat in, a bunch of us sat in on a talk about 21st century learning and with a very uh, knowledgeable and, and, and industrious person and conscientious good person. But you know, I'm just hearing words like this and I don't know anything about how to set these up or what they mean or where to go with them and, and I don't know, you know, what am I supposed to do? How can I remember those? I don't have any place to hang these associations. And that's where kids are a lot in school. It's just like isolated bits of information with no schema, no framework. And if you can't attend, that's going to just complicate things even further. How do you form memories unless you can attend and filter selectively and then also have a cognitive framework on which to hang that thing that you filtered and attended to? So I thought we'd do a little bit on memory. We're already a little low on time. So, uh, I think that's a great one too. Uh, on the back side of your yellow piece of paper, a little memory task. So let's try it. First, I suspect, well, you're obviously a very smart audience. Look at that for a second. Could you recreate that dot array? <laughs> Could you take the red dot array and place it on top of the black dot array in your brain? Do it. Yeah, uh, neither can I. Uh, yeah, they were different, but someone with eidetic imagery can do that. They can actually take the red one from that exposure, take the red dot array, put it on top of the black dot array, and then be like, oh, 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 look, 63. And when you, when, occasionally you get a kid, we have a couple of teachers in the school who actually tell the kids, I have a photographic memory. And after we do this, uh, kids go to the teacher and say, you should go see Mr. Sullivan uh, do the photographic memory test, because that's really rare. This is a more uh, old-fashioned photographic memory test. That's an actual photographic memory test, which is often called eidetic imagery or eidetic memory. OK, good. Could you recreate that array? How would you do on a recognition task? Was there an umbrella? Was there a pencil? Yes. Was there a banjo? A banjo. How about an ink blotter? <laughs> I'm making that one up, as you can tell. I think that, I bet that wasn't there. <laughs> anyway, someone with eidetic imagery can we cut with that exposure? Can we uh, um, assemble that perfectly in the same orientation? That's eidetic imagery. How many people have that? But when we actually test short-term memory capacity, I've wondered some, have kids' short-term memory capacity changed? 
So let's do some quick studies on that. Uh, the classic study of short-term memory is verbal digit span. I read a number, you then repeat it back to me, or you write it down. And we could do that, but since we've been doing a lot of visual stuff, we're going to do some visual versions, see how you do. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, first some number arrays. When I say go, write down the number you just saw. Okay, so here we go. Here is number one. Ready? Go. Here is number two. Ready? Just do the best you can. Go. Ready? Here's number three. Go. I get a lot of groaning with that in school. That's a problem right there, me talking while you were doing it. I'm sorry. Here's number four. Go. OK, we'll check how you did in a second. How would you do with letters? Better, worse, sort of same. Uh, let's try some letters. You ready? Here we go. Ready. Here's number five. Go. Here's number six. Sorry, I'm going fast here. Ready? Go. Let's check yourselves. How do you think you did? That one had eight letters. The long number had nine digits, which is right at the ceiling of short-term memory capacity for almost all humans, yes. Yep. Well, of course, that's one of the strategies, chunking. Likewise with the letters, people are like, that's Abraham Mac, you know, and so on, and then they just say, you can do that, good strategy, let's see how it worked. Check yourself. I chunked them there just to make it easier for you to check them. I hope you can see the bottom. Now, this one is right at the edge of short-term memory capacity in most humans. Does anyone here think you would have done better if I did it verbally instead of visually? Would you have done better auditorily? You think you do better visually? Uh, this one has eight right near the top edge of short-term memory capacity. But then, back to the comment we had before. I'm sorry? We're more experienced with numbers than with Yes, and except that's come up too. I we really found this interesting. Now when we're talking about chunking in memory, always me, old person, say, well, a phone number is chunked. And so many kids now do not know phone numbers. They don't know phone numbers at all. And they really don't know. Well, I still know my, the girl that I had a crush on in sixth grade. I remember her phone number, <laughs> which says a lot about me, I'm sure. But I, I still remember my phone number from when I was a, you know, little. I have a million phone numbers in my head, do you? Little kids don't have phone numbers anymore. So when I say that, like, phone numbers are chunking, they're like, say that again? <laughs> like, phone numbers, you know all those things you dial when, no, you don't do that, okay, forget it. <laughs> yes? I found this test interesting because it actually brought out something that I didn't identify until very late in my life, and it's dyslexia. Because I can chunk, no problem there, but from, my, from what I see to the time I put it on the paper, something gets transposed. Ah. And it took me calculus to figure that out. I had to take really? calculus three times because every time I worked out the problem, I'd get it wrong. And if I worked with a tutor, they'd write out the problem and I'd get it right. Mm -hmm. It was me transposing the problem from the page to the paper. So I never, I never ended up with the right answer. Do you mind me asking, how did that manifest itself in this test? Did you actually, did that make you? I transposed the three and the one on yeah. the first line. Mm -hmm. I transposed on the bottom on the, um, the P and the B. Mm -hmm. well, it sounds like you did well. Uh, I have kids sometimes still say like, do I have to have them in order? <laughs> <laughs> like, I have an eight. <laughs> like, okay, good, there's an eight in there, but <laughs> there's only so many choices, kid. <laughs> but uh, 
Anyway, let's try images. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, again, I, I really think I would never say for a moment that their brains are worse than mine or yours. They're not worse. I'm wondering if they're a little different. Because in terms of their ability to recall information and so on, generally speaking, I think they're fine. But I have noticed some deficiencies in this over the last 10 years. It's only anecdotal. But then I ran these uh, by people before, and it mirrored some of what had been found at a Sanford study. One of the things I tried to build in was let's take meaning out entirely. No chunking, no word attempts. Let's just see how much you can take in. So count the number of circles, OK? And just write the number of circles. Here is number seven. You ready? It's only going to be there a moment. How many circles? Write it down. <laughs> we'll check in a second, OK? Here is number eight. Ready? How many circles? Go. Ideally, I'd have this on a timer. I'm doing, I, I've practiced, done this with kids enough. I, I'm doing OK on the time presentation, but it's not perfect. Here's number, what, nine. Ready? Would that have been more difficult if it was the first one? Because how much are you doing that based on the context of the ones before? Question. Here's number 10. Let's see how you do. Ready? How many circles? Let's test yourself. 9, 6, 10, 7. How'd you do? And how many got all four? Now, 10 is a lot of information. It's too much in terms of letters and numbers unless you have eidetic imagery, yet you did fine with that. Uh, do you still have an image? Like, could you find it? You could close your eyes and still have the little iconic image there? No. Yes. I still jump them in my trees. Really? Every one I jump by trees. Even that one? Yeah. How about that one? Yeah. I jump by splitting it into two groups and Split the page in half, sort of? Yeah, yeah. split the page in half. You've got two five, ah. which I could barely register. So my, I got 10 correct, but it was more of a guess. The others I'm pretty sure about. Mine. But I could, finish, I could finish counting after the picture was gone. Right. Mm -hmm. I could still finish counting. Yeah. I could still see it. And yes, sir? Yeah, I would chunk into the patterns, and then I would count the patterns later. So I would kind of, if I drew a line, I would count, oh, there were four below the line. Mm -hmm. Later, so I was able to remember. Terrific and obviously effective strategies here. The kids did pretty well on that, too, in terms of number correct overall on those 10 short-term memory tasks. Uh, how about you, of those 10 short-term memory tasks, how many of you got eight or more correct? Uh, and uh, you see it kind of means here, anyway. One kid uh, in the low group there got all 10 of them correct, uh, including the two long number and letter arrays. and. Uh, She's an impressive person. It didn't surprise me too much. But I don't necessarily find a uh, correlation between their performance on this and their other measures of what we might think of as intelligence. That's supposedly short-term memory capacity. Uh, seven plus or minus two items, a magic number for short-term memory <coughs> capacity. Uh, but one question that I have, and I know we're low on time, is have kids changed because of the attention issues we are at least considering? Are they different in their ways of encoding information? You can't really remember something unless you can encode it, which basically means first you have to sift through an array of stimuli and choose the one you need to attend to, then identify it in some meaningful way, then tag it or label it in a way so you can store it eventually to retrieve it. One of the ways we get at that idea is, is in class we ask, like, can you remember the seven dwarves? How many think you can remember the seven dwarves snowing the seven dwarves? How would you do in a recognition desk? It was kind of fun to make this up. Let's see how we do. <laughs> so, who's confident? Who can name the seven dwarfs? Yes. Don't 
The reason, thank you. The reason I have, well, why have some of these choices? Like, why have pop? Because a lot of people will remember. I know I find this a lot. Oftentimes, I'm like trying to remember a word. And I'm like, I know it's a long word. I always found that interesting. Like, how do I know it's a long word that begins with L? But I can't get the word. That seems silly to me. And I think part of it has to do with encoding. I could be wrong. Uh, I, when I've asked kids in the past to remember them, they'll come up with, uh, okay, it was like sleepy and happy and like, I don't know, sleazy something, because that they clearly acoustically encoded them. Semantic encoding, acoustic encoding, and so on. Are people less able to encode well if their attention is, is different? Yes? I heard um, there was a study done, I, I, I can't quote it accurately, but it was at uh, MIT, they were dealing with uh, wearable computers. There's you know, the guy with the little camera on his glasses and he's reading the screen and he's walking and doing his thing. And he had it set up for name recognition. So if somebody carrying a token in their pocket was detected by the computer in his jacket, the name would flash on the screen in a semi-subliminal way, thinking that would be reminded of the name. Mm -hmm. And in that study, you found that even if the name flashed on the screen were wrong, it was, it was a statistically significant improvement in his ability to remember the correct name. Hmm. So it's sort of like walking up to someone whose name is Bill, but you can't remember it, and then someone says, his name's Dave. And somehow you go, no, no, it's Bill. And somehow the wrong name reminds you of the correct one. And I'm not quite sure why, where the encoding hmm. is or the reminder. It's maybe, I think of it as like aligning your memory in such a way that you can then finish Oh, even saying that is just encoding, though. They like they always teach, I, well, I don't know, always teach, but teach salespeople and so on. At a party, the reason people don't remember names at a party is because they never got it. That someone says, this is Bill, and you're like, hi, and then it's already gone. You didn't enter it. And that's why so often you're trying to just say Bill, hi, Bill, and that by itself encodes that you're more likely to recall it. It seemed that task, even though it seems counterintuitive, would be, Anything that made you re to think about it and do something to process it would make you more likely to be able to retain it. Yes, sorry, sir. Did I miss it? Or did you say that what was the name of the study? I don't, I don't remember. I could have, have to look it up. But it was glasses. It was, it was about wearable computers and subliminal messaging. Wow. I have a comment I'd like to make. I just recently read a book called Reading in the Brain. And uh, one of the points he makes is that when you're reading information in, there are neurons in your brain that both reinforce something because you've know it, and therefore it can figure out that it knows what it is. But there are also neurons in your brain that negate things. Because it's definitely not this. Mm -hmm. So when I hear that, what I'm hearing is that if someone says, Bill, that was Dave, there's something in your brain that can know it. Listen to that one. That helps you remember the other one. Mm -hmm. well, it seems like once you're thinking of vowels, you see vowels. So I'm wondering if it's once you get a name, you're better able to think name. Somehow helping you in that way. That sounds reasonable. I think the other thing I'd like to make really quickly I could is in that book, he makes a specific point is that everyone has to learn to read because there's nothing in our brains, in our brain structure that actually uh, is is meant for reading. Right? And the point he makes is that from an evolutionary point of view, you know, most ancestors of ours have only read for several, you know, for several uh, uh, for maybe you know, one, one or two or three hundred years, and there's nothing in our brains in evolution that mm -hmm. can help us do that. But vision is probably the most deeply ingrained, and then all the uh, and then you know, um, uh, 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 phonics is probably the next. Mm -hmm. And then so there's some things like for example, you know, some of these tests we probably did very well if there was a visual component to read a good at it. And then you know, uh, uh, the voice if, if you can hear it. We, you better remember it. But if you had to do things that really dealt with reading, per se, that's actually much harder to do because hmm. they have to learn all of it. I have a couple of questions when you finish, and then um, at the end, you've got to make some Yeah, I'm sorry. I know we're running low on time. Do you want to make the point quickly? Thank you. Quick question. How many of the kids have been given any training in things like choking? I mean, it's something that we grew up with because we grew up with phone numbers, mm -hmm. so it's sort of automatic for us. Put things in little groups because it's easier to remember. But like you said, nowadays they don't. So do they have something else that trains them in doing that? Kind of I have two sort of thoughts on that. One in our unit on memory and so on, we do end up talking about different ways that you can encode information. We teach them mnemonic devices and so on, and chunking, rehearsal, so on. But a lot of the kids do what you've done when we're debriefing this. They 
they develop strategies on the fly. And they may not have used the word chunking, but they would have described some of the same things with the circles that you did. I broke the page in half, or with the rectangles. I kind of triangulated the rectangles or something, which I wouldn't have done, but they do quite well. The chunking and so on, we do instruct them on as time goes on. And that's one of my last points, too, about what we need to instruct them on more. Uh, you made a great point before about this. Uh, and that's a Darwin quote, but there's a concept called the Dunning-Kruger effect that I just love from 1999. Uh, and in the Dunning-Kruger effect, they tested people on uh, three measures, uh, logic, grammar, and um, a humor. And uh, the humor example is great, I think. And I mentioned this to the kids. And they, I said, so do you know anyone who uh, always tells stories and they're never funny? Do they? And people are like, oh, yeah. They're like pointing at each other. Uh, and, uh, and I said, so why? Do they not know that they're not funny? Like the person you work with, uh, uh, in a, you know, and you go have lunch with them every day, and they start the story, and you're like, uh-oh. They're starting another story, and you know it's going to go for 12 minutes, and it won't be that funny. Do they not get that? Dunning and Kruger found that they asked people to do these tasks, and then asked them afterwards, how do you think you did? In terms of percentiles, what percentile do you think you're at? And the people said, oh, you know, I'm like 70th percentile for funny. I'm like funny, you know, I know I'm funnier than him, you know? Uh, then they actually, they did one study where they had people like tell a joke. And everyone tells the same joke. And people respond, like rated afterwards, like, is that good? People are like, that was just a terrific telling of that joke. And other people's like, no, that was, you know, a porpoise would have done better with that joke. Uh, and then they rated them percentile-wise, and they showed the people the results. And the one group they showed was in the 12th percentile. They had outperformed 12% of people on humor. 87, 88% had outperformed them. They showed them. Actually, according to ratings, you didn't do that great. You're only 12th percentile. So with that in mind, how do you think you did on the humor thing? And they said, 70th percentile. I'm still good. They're, they're wrong, basically. They don't know funny. And uh, that they called illusory superiority, <laughs> which I think is a great uh, term. That the idea that people have an illusion sometimes of knowing, and I frankly think a lot about driving as an example of this. And uh, I'm talking about they, those people who have illusory superiority. But um, uh, there is, <laughs> this is sort of generational, but. So uh, one argument they would have made is that a very large percentage of people are unskilled and unaware of it. And that in some ways, the fact that they're unskilled is what makes them unaware. And I, I'm not being judgmental about the kids, but dry, you think of driving, you know, there are people who drive uh, who are seemingly oblivious. But their very obliviousness is what makes them oblivious to their obliviousness. They could be, they think they're doing great, nobody's dead. Uh, and the very fact that they're not good at it is part of what blocks them from knowing they're not good at it. And that concept, here's a couple of quotes from their research uh, that you can, uh, that kind of state this well, um, that people get trapped in thinking that they're good, which has been called the overconfidence effect, the Lake Wobegon effect, Garrison Keillor, like everyone's above average. But the this is overestimating your ability, and that overestimation actually makes you less likely to ever be able to be aware that you're overestimating. And they also said, uh, conversely, people who were competent tend to underestimate themselves in comparison to others. That they think, well, I can do that. Other people must be able to do that at least as well as I can. And it turns out, yeah, actually, no. Uh, and the reason I bring it up here is because I do think at the very least as teachers, I want to think more about exposing people to the possibility that we don't know. 
uh, which is a big part of our Time to Think course. Like, well, you know, you think you know stuff. What do you really know? One of the things I think Mike will agree in psych is kids will even say that in course evaluations. Like, you know, I used to think I knew stuff about the way people thought, and it's so interesting to kind of have those challenged. And that seems important to me when we're talking about technology, when we're talking about how it affects kids' cognitive world, to keep reminding people about asking questions about short-term memory capacity and about knowing, but also about teaching how to filter relevant, re irrelevant material, not just hoping that people can do it. And also helping kids to be metacognitive, thinking about their own thinking, thinking about their own decision making, their own performance. And I have found, I'm very hopeful about this, kids are great at that. If you ask them questions, they're good at that. They're willing to think about why they do something well, if they do something well, how do they do it, what would they do to do it better. I find that they're quite good at that. What happens between being 17 and being 37 and driving down the road doing six tasks and, and not being aware of how poorly you're doing it, I don't know. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, maybe I have a bias about filtering or a selective attention that actually would block us in terms of creative problem solving and creative production. And so therefore, I'm not saying selective attention is the only way to go in a cognitive world. And uh, I am interested in cross-cultural differences. I wonder uh, if there would be differences in cultures that have more tech exposure, less tech exposure, and so on. And of course, our definitions of what smart is, which has always had a cultural component. What is smart has always had some cultural application to it. This, I'm sorry for the bad quality, but when I first saw this cartoon, I nearly expired. Uh, I had a near-death experience. I like dislodged my spleen, basically. And I know now you can't even see it, but I insisted on putting it anyway because I thought it was so funny. These guys are like, coming up with a box to trap the edible. That's a box. But they're in the box. So when the animal goes in, they're going to pull the thing out, but you see, they're going to be in the, in the box. <laughs> it's not going to work really well. When I saw that, I like, had a humor-induced splenectomy, basically. <laughs> the same with this, you might have seen before. Uh, back early technology days. <laughs> There's only two spaces there. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, I would like, we we're low on time, we we're going to go have dessert, but I wanted to ask you more about uh, you from your own domains, what you would take away from this, if anything. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to you about that more, or happy to email with you or talk with you. And uh, I really appreciate you being such a kind uh, audience. So thank you very much.